Can you hear me? So, um, first of all, I would like to um, convey my thanks to the Florida Atlantic University for hosting this event. It's really very kind of them to do that. And also to uh, the members of the Peaceful Mind, Peaceful Life, of the Schmidt especially, and Mary and Adrian, all their friends, for inviting me here and helping to make this event a possibility. You know, you all sit here, but actually to get this sitting here is taking a lot of work uh, on behalf of many, many people who you will never meet. So, from my side, I would like to say a sincere thank you to them all. Be nicely. Oh, I'm back again. Um, so this evening we're going to talk basically about how to uh, transform our ordinary life into a spiritual path. So normally when people think, hold on. I, could go on forever, you see, so I have to time myself. <laughs> Normally when people think about uh, Buddhism in the West, uh, they think, ah, oh, meditation. Whereas, in fact, if you go to Buddhist countries in Asia, very few people actually meditate. Even monks and nuns, very few actually, actually sit down and meditate. They do a lot of puja and study, but people who actually uh, do what we consider to be meditation, silent meditation, are actually very few. In, in Asia, Buddhism is uh, mainly, especially for the laity, is ethics and generosity and devotion. The uh, Asian Buddhists are extremely devotional. But I was thinking, you know, normally in traditional texts, the audience, they're written by monks, and the audience aimed at are other monks, a few nuns, if they can read, and, um, and hermit types. And of course, this gives a rather distorted view of the path, in a way. So, as one goes around the world, both in Asia and in the West, of course, one audiences are, are lay people, people with, you know, families, people with professions, people with social responsibilities. They are not people who have, you know, total time only to sit and to study and, and to practice. And sometimes it looks like People feel, oh, well, you know, it's, it's very nice, but, you know, I'm just an, an ordinary person with my own life, and I don't have all those hours and hours every day to dedicate to spiritual practice. So, therefore, you know, maybe I'll try next life. <laughs> so, what I, I want to explain is that actually, Buddhism and spiritual life in general is not only about meditation. And so this evening we're going to formulate it as what are called in, in the paramitas, which means, um, what well it means literally to go beyond, but it could be translated as the perfections. These are uh, six 
practices which are needed in order to attain enlightenment. It's not just meditation. And as we go through them, you will understand that, that actually the everyday life is a perfect vehicle for, for uh, developing, cultivating these qualities. We're better. So these qualities are, um, well in Sanskrit it's dana, which means like generosity, giving, then um, shila, or ethics, um, shanti, patience, forbearance, virya, or effort, or enthusiasm, and then dhyana or concentration, meditation, and then prajna or wisdom. So um, we don't have much time, but anyway, briefly, we will go through these because all of these qualities are essential for the path. And we can see that most of them we can, well, all of them, of course, we can develop in our daily life, using our daily life as our practice. So the first quality is dharma or generosity. And this is something which is very much emphasized in Asia. Um, not only in Buddhist circles, but in all circles, Hindu and Islamic and Christian and Jewish, everybody understands that it's very important to give, to share. And I think the Buddha put it at the beginning of his, um, his path because it's something which we can all do. Even if we are very distracted, even if we're not terribly ethical, even if we have many problems on the way, we can still be kind and generous. And of course it doesn't just mean with money and material things, but also with ourselves, with our attention. People need help, we listen. People need consolation, we're there for them. It's a matter of opening the heart. And so this is a very good way to start the spiritual path, is by opening up the heart, as well as the hands. One time when I was, I had these friends who were Sufi, and they had a little son who was about four years old at that time. And someone had given him a, a, a little box of chocolates. And so he was terribly excited. I mean, he had never in his whole life had a box of chocolates or to himself before. And so he was holding them to his chest. And his uh, mother said, why don't you offer one of your chocolates to the, the Anila, to me? And he said, no, they're mine. <laughs> and his father said, yes, of course they're yours. That's why you can share them with others. So the little boy thought about that one, because he was only four. <laughs> He got it. And then he opened his box and he insisted that everyone in the room took a chocolate. With great joy. And I thought, what a wonderful lesson to learn so early in life. That we have things so that we can share them with others and give joy to others. Not keep it all to ourselves. If we keep it all to ourselves, then we get like this. Don't you come near my things. These are my things. But if you open up your hands, it opens up the heart. 
And when we open up our heart, joy arises. So much more joy in giving than in receiving. Right? It is more blessed to give than to receive. Everybody's agreed on that. So this is a very important opening to recognize that the happiness of others is not only in many ways so much more important than trying to always grasp at our own happiness, but that in giving happiness to others, this is the best way for us to also be really inwardly joyful. This is a very important point in our life. That if we spend all our time trying to make ourselves happy, we will just end up desperate. Whereas, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama goes around telling everybody, if you want to be happy, make others happy. <coughs> if we genuinely are more concerned with bringing happiness to others, then we ourselves will fill our, like an empty vessel inside us, filling up more and more and more and more as we give and give and give. And as I said, it's not just material things, though material things are important, especially in our society where everybody is encouraged to accumulate more and more. The idea that actually it's so much more fun to give and give and give. But also just to give, you know, I mean, I'm sure many of you, you visit people in hospitals or you're working for various NGOs or charitable organizations, and there's a joy in that. In Taiwan, there is a nun called uh, Cheng Yu. I'm looking at the Chinese here to see if I got the pronunciation. And uh, she has an organization called Suti, which means loving kindness. And millions and millions of people, it's an international organization. And, and they, they have big state-of-the-art hospitals and, and schools, and they go especially for um, disaster areas. They're one of the first people there helping. But one of the things which he started right from the start was that, you know, these big businessmen and wealthy people, they could not just write checks. They, she would not accept their money if they didn't come and do something. So she had all these big businessmen, politicians, bankers, out there digging ditches and rolling bandages, visiting the sick and the old, doing things. And it changed their lives. So easy to write a check if you're very wealthy and feel virtuous. But she got them giving themselves. And so it completely transformed their life. And as a result, her, her um, organization has spread worldwide. It's full of very beautiful people doing things for others with great joy, great happiness. So one could go on about this, but we have restrictions of time. But really, the first thing to do on the spiritual path is to start opening up our heart to include others and that well-being and happiness of others. That lightens us, actually. The uh, second of these paramitas, or perfections, is the perfection of ethics. And basically, this in Buddhism are the five 
lay precepts. These are precepts, they're not commandments. Precepts means they're rules of training. This is how we are going to try to be. And these rules of training in, in Buddhism um, are nothing to do with what we eat or what we wear. They are dealing with how to live in this world harmlessly. So the precepts are not to take life, that means not to kill. This means not just human beings, but also animals, insects, fish, birds, anything which has sentient life. Why? Because just as for each one of us, our own life is most dear, likewise for all beings, their own life is most dear. Everybody. All animals, insects, birds, fish, None of them want to die. All of them feel fear if they're threatened. I have always thought it quite extraordinary how absolutely really nice, good-hearted people can consider it a sport and a pleasure, for example, to go fishing. There you have this poor fish with a huge hook in its mouth struggling for its life, in great pain, unable to breathe, out of its element, fighting desperately to live. And that's considered fun. Imagine yourselves with a big hook in your mouth, unable to breathe. Would you think that was funny? So, each being holds its own life as very precious. It does not want to die. It does not want to be harmed. So the first precept is the most important precept. The precept to value the life of all beings as much as we possibly can. And really, if for any reason we have to take the life of any being, we should do so with regret. We should not think it's sporting or that it's fun. Because you've taken some being's life, which was really all it had as its most precious possession. So the second precept is not to take that which is not given, which means not to steal, basically. Um, so again, we are very conscious of our own possessions. We don't like it when anybody takes our possessions. So, of course, we should also be very careful to not take the possessions of other people. I think this also would extend to lending and borrowing. Because, again, if we borrow something from somebody, then that is their property. And we should be very careful to return it. Books and DVDs in particular seem to develop legs and walk away. And so we should be very scrupulous when we borrow things, especially things like books which are quite fragile, to take care of them with more care than if it were our own and to return them in at least as good a condition as we um, borrowed them. And to be scrupulous about this. To be careful with other people's properties. The third precept is the precept against sexual misconduct. And again, basically this means that since the sexual urge is very powerful, we should be very careful and very responsible not to exploit another. Not to use another purely for our own satisfaction and pleasure without consideration for that person. 
and the repercussions of having sexual relations with that person and anyone else. Will anyone be harmed by this relationship? Will anyone be adversely affected? Are there going to be unfortunate consequences? We should be responsible. Can anyone be hurt by this? Is this relationship based on lust or on affection? Are we just exploiting the other? So, I mean, this is a huge subject and it's not really the point in this evening's talk, but we nonetheless, each one of us, has people always can um, condone their own actions, you know, we can always find excuses. But really we should be very careful with our conduct and how it affects others. For the better or for the worse, we should really be very careful, isn't it? The next precept is um, about um, not telling untruths, about being truthful. So our speech again should be truthful. People should be able to trust us. That we are not trying to cheat them, or lie to them, or, or in any way um, you know, deceive them. This is especially important not only in relationships, but also in our business world, that people should uh, be able to rely on us, that if we have a product which we are trying to promote, that we should be honest. Wouldn't that make a change? And that people can rely on us, people can believe in us. But speech should not just be truthful, it should also be kind. Sometimes people like to tell truths which are very hurtful. So truth is good, but we should also be very careful that it doesn't create you know, hurt for others. So speech should be truthful, it should also not be slanderous, it should also not be divisive, separating people who have been friends by turning one against the other and dividing them. So we should be kind, helpful, truthful, and also not caught up too much in gossip and idle talk. Sometimes it's very useful, you know, to stand back and just listen to oneself. What one is talking about at any given time. Just listen to yourself. Not judging, just, just hearing the tone of the voice, what you're talking about, and then apply these guidelines. Is it truthful? Is it helpful and kind? Is it just idle talk? We spend so much time listening to turn on the television, untruths, harsh speech, and lots and lots of idle talk. So we should ration ourselves and make sure that what comes out from our mouths, at least, is conducive to harmony and happiness of others. Because we are the one species which have speech. No other species on earth talk 
have language in the way that we do. Animals communicate, but they communicate in a very different, more non-verbal way. Maybe that's more profound than our talk, talk, talk. But it's not, we've cut ourselves off from that. Now we rely on speech. In this we are unique, and so we should be responsible for our speech. Because our speech also affects others. You know, many people, even as they grow up, and you know, and they have problems and you know psychological differences, difficulties, and often it comes when you trace the root to something that somebody, especially their mother or their father, said when they were young. Something very negative which probably wasn't even true, and they just said it when they were being feeling a bit peeved. But nonetheless, it entered into the heart of that child. And, that, and even as an adult, they have it at the, the you know, center of their being. And it very much influences how they see themselves. And if it's something negative, then it can really color their whole existence. For example, I had a friend who um, was very, very attractive and, and uh, very intelligent. She had a PhD, she had, was running a business, she was very successful, everybody liked her, but she had very, very low self-esteem. And she really didn't like herself at all. And, and eventually she realized, she, she somehow, I don't know if she was in therapy or what, but she suddenly re remembered she, her mother saying to her when she was very small, oh, you're so ugly and stupid. And that was what she got. She was ugly and she was stupid. And however much people would tell her to the contrary, that was what she believed. It was in, inscribed in her heart. I'm ugly and I'm stupid. And that came from some, you know, her mother, of course, five minutes later had forgotten all about it. But this woman took it with her 50 years later. She still had that. So we have to be very careful of our speech. Really, really responsible not to say things in the moment that later we could ever regret. Really listen to what we talk about. Also what we talk about to ourselves. Our inner chatter. The fifth precept is against alcohol, uh, drugs, or anything which intoxicates the mind. Uh, this is because Buddhism is dealing with how to become the master of our mind rather than the slaves and under normal circumstances uh, imbibing intoxicants or taking drugs alters the mind so that we are not the masters, we are not in control. Uh, some teachers say this means total abstinence, and in the case of monks and nuns, it certainly does. Uh, some people argue that a glass of wine with dinner does not mean um, that you're breaking this precept. But, of course, as long as it just stays with one glass. Um, because we know that all, despite the fact that nowadays in the West there's this huge campaign against smoking and people who smoke are like pariahs. I mean, you've seen in airports where these poor things are in this glass cage which everybody can look at as they go by and all frantically puff. I mean, you know, really, this is, somebody should start a sort of human rights inquiry, you know? Um, and of course smoking is, is, is not good, you know, it's, it's bad for the health, but it's nothing compared with alcohol. I mean, people don't start smoking and then go out mugging people. 
or come home and start beating up their wives and children, they don't start, you know, driving crazily just because they're smoking a cigarette. I mean, most of the crimes which are committed, both domestic and, uh, you know, out in the streets, are under the influence of alcohol and drugs, as we know. And yet those are promoted, and not, not drugs, but alcohol is promoted as being chic and, you know, big, big advertisement for vodka and whiskey and all these things, as if it's something admirable to drink. It's very socially acceptable. If you say you don't drink, people think you're weird. So, you know, again, we should think about this one, you know? Really, think about it. People who are drunk or intoxicated are not admirable. It brings out so much of the worst tendencies in us. People do things under the influence of drink which they would never do in a sober mind. And sobriety is what we are aiming for, at least to be in control of our, our awareness, to be more and more conscious, not less and less conscious. So all these rules are how to live in the world harmlessly. If people in this world right now just kept these basic five precepts, it would be a completely different world. They are not something which was important 2,500 years ago, but are not relevant today, or which were relevant in India and not here in the United States. They are eternal laws of how to live in the world so that even if we don't do anything else, we are at least leading a life which causes no harm to other beings. So that is not killing, not stealing, not lying, not uh, committing sexual misconduct, and um, abstaining from intoxicants. Now, the, the next of these perfections is a very important one, is the perfection of patience. And this is the antidote to anger. Uh, this is again a huge subject and I can only skim the surface, but um, I think we can all appreciate that our daily life, our family life, our workplace, and so forth, are a wonderful field for practicing patience. Even just driving, although of course your roads are very well disciplined, Try to come to India. Um, but nonetheless, driving and so forth, wonderful, wonderful opportunities for practicing how to relax inwardly and not react with irritation, frustration, anger. So how to develop patience? Well, as I say, this is a big subject. We can only do with one or two um, points here. But one of them is that normally when somebody upsets us and angers us, we regard them as an obstacle to ourselves being tranquil and peaceful, nice, friendly people. I would be fine if it wasn't for my awful neighbor, or my dreadful boss, or my wife, or my husband, or whoever, you know, 
it's their problem. They are the ones which create all, all my difficulties, so I have a right to be angry. So in the development of patience, we recognize this is a very, very important spiritual quality. Not to react with anger in the face of something which we regard as being antagonistic. So as with any practice, as with any quality, we need to practice it, don't we? You know? So it's very easy to be loving and friendly and kind, surrounded by people who are loving and friendly and kind. I mean, I, for example, here, everybody's so sweet and everybody's smiling and bending over backwards to be helpful and kind. And this is wonderful. But it can lull one into a false sense of complacency that one, therefore, is also loving and friendly and kind under all circumstances because one only meets with that. So, therefore, in order to really practice, we need people who are obnoxious. <laughs> I'm serious. Shanti Deva, a great 8th century um, pundit in India, he said that therefore we should regard our, our antagonist, our enemy, as our greatest spiritual friend. Because they're helping us to develop this very important quality without which we, we will not be able to attain to enlightenment. So instead of thinking that this person is, is a, a problem for us, we should be grateful. And so when somebody is very difficult for us and creates a lot of problems for us, instead of getting all riled up and angry and upset about it, we can think, Oh, thank you. Oh, you're so awful. That's, that's great. Now I can really practice. Without you, what would I have done? <laughs> and then that transforms the whole situation. Now, of course, this does not mean that if we are in a heavily abusive situation, we just sit down and say, hit me harder. But it does mean that even if one is in an abusive situation, one can extricate oneself as quickly as possible, but nonetheless with love and compassion in the heart. The Buddha said that um, hatred does not cease with hatred. Hatred ceases with non-hatred, in other words, with love. And if, we, if someone is difficult to us and in return we get angry and frustrated, we've, we've doubled the problem. Do you understand? Like if somebody does something to us, cheats us or is difficult with us, and then we feel all this anger and frustration and bitterness in our heart, then we are torturing ourselves, right? It's not affecting that person. They're fine. We are only doing to ourselves what our worst enemy would do for us. Right? So we're giving ourselves a double dose. Whereas if we take that and, and transform it into an opportunity to develop and, and to go forward, then nothing can harm us. It's part of our spiritual development. And this is not just with people, but also with circumstances. Everybody now is beginning to understand that difficult circumstances are actually our greatest opportunities, our greatest opportunities to grow. This doesn't mean that we have to manufacture difficulty and, and obnoxious people. Sit there, they will come.
But when they come, how we respond is the important thing. Somebody said that life is the gymnasium of the soul. And if you think of a gymnasium, it's full of machines which are designed, designed to challenge our flabby muscles, right? If they're not hard enough, you, you, you turn it up so that it is always challenging, challenging, challenging. That's how we grow strong, isn't it? That's how we get strong muscles, that's how we gain strength. And likewise, inwardly, we gain strength through dealing with our difficulties in a way which can use those difficulties as the path. Because if we recognize that whatever comes to us, we can use it as the path, then there is no fear. You know, normally we are caught up in our hopes and fears, hoping things will go right, fearing that they will go wrong. But if we know that everything which happens to us, we can use it, we can take it with us. This is our lesson that we have to learn. Then whatever happens to us, we can do it. It's okay. No problem. The problem is really that, especially in the modern day, we have this idea that life, a well-lived life means that all our mundane wishes should be satisfied and that we should get as much physical and emotional stimulation and pleasure as possible. That means a good life. It's not true. We are here to learn. We are here to grow up. The Buddha said, when he talks about ordinary people like us, he, he calls us the childish. And so the whole of the spiritual path is to grow up and become an adult, not to remain childish. Little children, when things go their way, happy, happy, smiley, smiley. The minute anything goes wrong, they don't know how to deal with their emotions. They're screaming and shouting, and it's like somebody's pulling them apart with red hot pinches. But it's only because they drop their sweet on the ground. But they can't contain their grief and their happiness and their anger. Their emotions are naked. And for us, the tragedy is that we grow up and inside we are still four years old, emotionally. We cover it up. The word persona, from which we get personality, as well as the idea of persona, means a mask. It's always a mask which was used in, in, um, in Rome and in, in Greece, as the actors didn't show their faces, they wore big masks to symbolize the, act, the, the character that they were playing. So it was the mask behind which the actor um, hid. It was a mask which they showed to the world on the stage. And so this is our personalities. We all project the personality which we want to have people believe in, and which we begin to believe in, which is our big tragedy. But inside, however outwardly sophisticated we might think we are, inwardly there is this little child. And so we have to grow up and put ourselves through school. And the school is our life. Life is teaching us lessons all the time, and whether or not we learn those lessons or whether we have to go back and do that year again, 
It depends on us. And we're better to burn than where you are right now, with who you are right now. Your family are a wonderful basis for practice. Your workplace, your colleagues, your friends, your activities, all of them, everything we can learn. You know, just even just to think of others, each person that you meet is at that time the most important person in the world because it's the person you're with. His Holiness the Dalai Lama is wonderful at this. You know, everybody who meets him, even if just for a second, feels transformed because in that moment they know that he's completely just looking at them. And when he takes their hand and looks in their eyes, they know that in that moment, just even just for that second, he only they exist for him. with kindness, totally non-judgmental, but seeing the person, not the persona. So you see all these politicians and um, you know, churchmen looking very embarrassed. Why is this you know, Because he's not relating to them as cardinal this or you know, the president of that. He's Looking at the person behind all that, with love and compassion, with total open acceptance. Each of us can do this. You know? When we meet somebody, in our mind, our first thought should be, may you be happy. Doesn't matter who. May you be happy. Because everyone wants happiness and get out of our own way.